We have a deep feeling that these lessons could be historic. We have spent several months preparing them and many hundreds of hours in preparing them. We trust that uh, the teaching syllabus that you will accumulate by placing each lesson in each week uh, will become a compendium of truth and knowledge that will help you to bless many people and that one you can refer back to uh, in every time that you need them. As we teach uh, these studies uh, relating to divine deliverance and teach these studies that are related to principalities and powers, uh, we trust that God will uh, make them to be all that you need. Whatever you need will be all that you need. Uh, today's lesson has to do with who's afraid of the big bad wolf. May I bless you. Father, we ask you to bless each one that studies the Word and let the Word of God become very strong and beautiful and powerful. Now, Lord, bless, we pray. We believe you to bless each one, and we thank you for it. Uh, this topic was taken from a nursery rhyme, of course, who's afraid of the big bad wolf, 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 wolf. And uh, God's people are not afraid. I can remember when fear was taken out of my heart as a young man, and it hadn't been back anymore. The Lord Jesus delivered me from fear. Now, if we're going to be afraid of the principalities and powers of the devil, uh, then we are not going to be successful deliverers of human beings. Uh, we've got to know and be sure that we know. We've got to be positive and positive that we're positive. And we've got to reach out there and do the thing God wants us to do with great strength. And if we will, it'll work. Now, I know it will work because I have seen all kinds of people set others free. I, I have seen children set people free. I, I have seen uh, nationals of various countries that did not have the strength that you have uh, set people free. And so it's not a matter of can you do it? We know you can do it, but you must believe. Uh, if you don't believe, you cannot set anybody free. From the Garden of Eden and the beginning of the Bible to the Valley of Jehoshaphat at the end of the Bible, that person that you know as the devil and Satan has taken on a form of tremendous proportions. Some would say almost frightening proportions. And who is this person? And should we be afraid of him? Should we laugh at him? Should we rebuke him? Or what is our relationship to him? God describes this person who from the Garden of Eden to the Valley of Jehoshaphat has tormented and hurt human beings. God has described this person as an angel, but he is a fallen angel. He is no longer in the place of authority and power before the throne of God that he was. At one time, uh, he was the center of heaven. And at one time, uh, he was the angel uh, through which, uh, the archangel through which all the majesty of God flowed out through him into heaven. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's simply in incredible the, 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 the thing that he had in heaven and that because of his uh, pride and his rebellion against God, he lost it. And he became the person from the Garden of Eden to the Valley of Jehoshaphat that hurt human beings that would accept his hurt. In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12, the Holy Spirit says through the prophet, How art thou fallen from heaven, Lucifer? That's the archangel we were telling you about. You are the son of the morning. That was his title, by the way. The son of the morning. So brilliant, so, so glorious until he was called the son of the brilliant day, daybreak. The son of the morning. And he says, how are you cast down to the ground? Huh. You used to wear all the diadems and wear all the gold and the, 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 the beautiful uh, jewels of heaven on your breast. Why are you cast down to the ground? And he says, you're the one who weakens the nations. I wish you'd underline that. Every nation that's ever been weakened has been weakened by the devil. The devil is the destroyer of nations. And every nation that has gone weak and, and gone poor and gone bad and has been weakened by the power of the devil. And Ezekiel, in describing the same personage in Ezekiel 28 and verse 14, says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Uh, he was the archangel that actually covered the throne of God in the center of heaven. And I have set you so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou walkst up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. <laughs> Here was one like, like, like no other. And, and, uh, and, and he lost that place before God. 
And now he's known in so many other ways. Did you know that there are 200 direct re references in the Bible to this person that fell, to, to this Lucifer, to this word, one called the devil? But God's people, nowhere, not one time in the Bible, are told that he could defeat them or that he could possess them or hurt them, that you have power over him in, in every way. How is he known to the world that we live in? Let us give you a few of the ways he's known. In 1 Peter 5 and 8, God says, be sober. That's not talking about alcohol. It's, it's talking about the attitude in which you live. A sober life, a life of understanding, uh, not, a, not, not a derelict that doesn't know what's going on in the world today. Be sober, be, be watchful, be vigilant. See what's going on. We, we are the people of God. We should know what things mean in, in the world that we live in today. Be, be watchful. It says, because your adversary, now you ought to underline that word, you have one chief enemy who is your adversary, and the Bible says that one is the devil, is the devil. Now, it's a remarkable thing to me uh, that thousands of preachers in this country never mention him at all as an adversary. And they never stand up and preach to the people and say, now listen, friends, you've got to de defeat this adversary. And they, they, they have no courage to do that. But the Bible says he is an adversary, and he's called the devil. And then it says he is as a roaring lion. It does not say he is a roaring lion. He is as a roaring lion. Now, a roaring lion is the strongest animal in the forest. In the jungle, the roaring lion is the king. And when he roars, he upsets the whole jungle. Everybody takes off when he roars. They say he's angry. Let's get out of the way here. Now, the Bible says that the devil acts like that. You say, what does it mean? He makes a lot of noise. Don't be afraid of him. It says, as a roaring lion, screaming and yelling, he might say today the church is not powerful, that the church cannot hurt him. Let him find out when people start believing the word of God and praying and fasting and get after him. He'll find out that the gates of hell cannot prevail. And hell happens to be his headquarters. Cannot prevail against this living church, this dynamic church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes about like a roaring lion. And, and what does he want to do? It says he's walking about. He is in movement, observing, looking in. New York City, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, Illinois, Miami, Florida, Los Angeles, California, walking about. What is his business on the face of the earth? God says here, he is seeking whom he may devour. People that are not alert, people that don't understand. He can bring things in our world today that we'll say, this is innocent, this is all right, and it's not all right at all. He's seeking whom he may devour. Paul says we, we are not ignorant of his devices, and we must never be ignorant of his devices. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So he goes about as a roaring lion. But God, God said something different about him. Uh, you will discover in this next uh, a line here in Genesis 3 and 1, uh, where it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, uh, which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Uh, here we have him designated as a, a serpent. As a serpent. And in Second uh, Corinthians 11 and 3 it says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Which meaning that we today could be deceived just like Eve was deceived by the subtlety of the serpent. Now the word uh, serpent there, as you can see, is from the Hebrew word anachis. And it means to hiss, it means to whisper, it means to enchant. The, the, the work of the serpent is to hiss, which means he's to frighten you. Uh, he is to whisper, to get your attention. And to enchant means to disillusion you and to deceive you. God doesn't want us deceived in any means by any modern thing, by any modern thing. Do you know a lot of us do things because the Joneses do? You better not. In these last days, the Joneses might be on their way to hell. And if you do like they do, and if you dress like they dress, and you talk like they talk, you go where they go, you may go to the wrong place. 
It's better to live your life by the word of God and, and to say, I am not living like somebody else. I am living like Jesus wants me to live. You'll make it for sure. You'll make it for sure. Uh, these are the, are the embellishments of this big bad wolf that wants to frighten people and, and to hurt people. In the word of God, he is called the prince of devils or demons or Beelzebub. Even the Lord Jesus was accused of this, of taking his place. In Matthew 12 and 24, if the Pharisees said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And so they called Beelzebub the prince of devils. And they said that the Lord Jesus was doing this through the power of Beelzebub, who is the prince of devils. And so that's one of his designations and one of his names as prince of all devils. Also, in your point number four on your lesson, uh, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 28, And he said unto them, Jesus speaking, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye, ye root up also the wheat that is with them. There is one that is called an enemy has done this. Well, an enemy is, is a person that wants to do you bad. An enemy is a person that wants to hurt you. An enemy is a person that wants to do you wrong. An enemy is the opposite of a friend. Where a friend wants to bless, an enemy wants to hurt. And the Bible says that the devil is your enemy. Now, hey, don't treat him like a friend now. And don't take him in and be hospitable to him. Uh, if he's an enemy, keep him on the outside. And, and, and be sure that he doesn't get close to you. And so the Lord Jesus said, an enemy hath done this. One of the most prevalent words that we ad ad identify Satan by is the word uh, devil. It comes directly from the Greek language and sounds almost as song, the same, but it's diabolos. And, and diabolos means accuser. It means slanderer. And we find that very graphically illustrated in the book of Job. In, in Job chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, There was a day I, I would like to sometime uh, uh, teach you on, on, a, on a very particular thing. Uh, uh, a number of years of my life, there were just two or three things that I couldn't get straight. I couldn't get straight uh, who Jesus preached to in prison. It says he preached to the angels. I couldn't get it straight who they were. I couldn't get it straight who Melchizedek was. I couldn't get it straight who the sons of God were in, in Genesis chapter 6 and the, and the sons of God were who were in, in Job chapters 1 and 2. And, and, and I couldn't put all that group together. And suddenly, uh, the Lord showed it to me, you know, that there was the priesthood of Melchizedek, and Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And they were the first uh, religious directors on the face of the earth that God had here. And we see two functions they had. One is in Job, where they came up to report to God, and, and God said, well, how's my servant Job? Oh, they said, great, great, prosperous, like the full gospel businessman. Everything's going great, making a new million every day, you know. And, and they were the, the, the priesthood. In Genesis chapter 6, it says, When the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of red earth, or Adam, that, that they were fair, that it took of them wives. You know what the next verse says? And there were giants in the earth in those days. There were monstrosities with six fingers and six toes, maybe two heads. I don't know, ten foot tall monstrosities. And God says, I'm sorry I ever made man. What had happened? The priesthood had fallen. They were the ones that Jesus preached to. You, you find it right there, you know, uh, when, when you're reading it in Peter and in, and, in, and in Jude, they're the ones that sinned in the days of Noah. And, and so there's a direct link proving it to you that nobody has a ch second chance and that he was only speaking to that created group of men that fell in the days and the days of Noah and Christ in order to reconcile everything in heaven and earth he went and preached to them and, and that was the way he was able to reconcile them and that Melchizedek was one that didn't fall and he continued possibly until the time that God instituted Moses he was uh, at the time Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees he was already already the king and the priest in Jerusalem and, and so I, I cleared up a lot of those things in my heart when God showed me that that number one priesthood on the face of the earth that remained in power until God chose his second priesthood, which is the Aaronic priesthood. So these sons of God, in my thinking, uh, they are like Melchizedek that you find in the book of Hebrews 5, 6, and 7. 
They presented themselves to God, and Satan came. The Lord said, where have you been? He said, going forth up and to and front. He said, and the earth says, have you seen Job? Oh, yes. You better believe I've seen him. God says he's perfect. God says he's upright. God says he fears me. He hates evil. And the devil answered back. He said, now, wait a minute here. He says, does he fear you for nothing? He says, you put a hedge around him about his house and about all that he has on every side. Uh, you have blessed him, and I want to assure you uh, that the word devil, meaning accuser and slanderer, that the devil will accuse and slander every one of us. And some of the things that come upon you might not mean that you're bad. It may mean that you're very good. The Bible says until this day, he is the one that stands before God Almighty and accuses the brethren. He says, you're too good to her. You're treating him too nice. He's making too much money. He's going to too good a church. You still here? Amen. Yeah. Let him talk. We're going to win anyway. Can you say amen? amen. And speaking of him, uh, the Bible also says in number six that he is a liar. Read John 8 and 44. Uh, ye are your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He is a liar and the father of lies. So the one that we're dealing with in these lessons, uh, we identify him from what the Word of God says who he is. In Revelation 16 and 14, for they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So right unto the very end of time, uh, he will perform lying wonders, deceiving people, and cause them to do things that later they'll say, my, I made a mistake there. And your point uh, number seven, uh, he is called a corrupter of minds. My, you'd like to spend an hour on each one of these, you know. In 2 Corinthians 11 and 3, it says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, I want to assure you that every cult is a corruption of their minds. You start talking to them and you'll see, you'll see their minds have been corrupted by untruth. Their minds have been corrupted by error. Their minds have been corrupted by lies, and they can't think straight and they can't believe straight because of the corruption that comes from the devil. The Bible says that the serpent, that the beguiled Eve is the same one who today corrupts the minds of human beings that they cannot believe the truth and cannot know how it means to be safe. The Bible also calls him the tempter. In, in Matthew 4 and 3, it says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. He is the tempter. God does not tempt you. The Bible says that God tempts no man. He is the tempter of humanity. When you are tempted, the devil is the one that does the temptation. He's also called the adversary. In 1 Peter 5 and 8, he says, as we read a little while ago, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He is your number one adversary. Uh, you, you think you've got enemies? He's at the top. He is your adversary. He is all of our adversary. He is the one that hates us more than anyone else. We must recognize that and we must deal with it on, on that basis. Uh, number 10, Satan. Uh, this is a Greek word, auto, satanas. I'm not quite sure that spelling is correct there. You ought to check that. It may be a little error. And in Revelation 12 and 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. There's a tremendous revelation of serpent. It says, uh, the dragon, he was cast out. He is called the serpent. He is called the devil. He is called Satan. God didn't want you to make any mistake. He is the one that deceives the whole world. All the deception in the world is won by him, nobody else. He is the deceiver of the whole world. It says that he was cast out into the earth. Uh, that will be during the great tribulation time. And his angels were cast out with him. Uh, they are the prince of the power of the air at this moment. And he is the one that deceives and hurts the people on the face of this earth. In the Revelation 20 and 3, it says, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more. He is a deceiver. He is a deceiver. I just put a little straight line right under that that he should deceive the nations no more. Every deception in the world, uh, like, like Nazism, for example, it was a diabolical deception from hell, and high in the world, those poor people in Germany ever believed it, I can't understand. 
Anybody could see it was a deception except them. Communism is a colossal deception. <laughs> and you want to know the truth? There are no communists. And if they are, you know where they are? They're right down here tonight. That's where they are. There are none of them in Russia. You know what a communist is? It's a person that makes everything he has common with others and says, sleep in my house tonight. I cook on my stove tomorrow. You use my car tomorrow, please. That's having everything in common. Now, that's the way did it, they did it in the first church in Jerusalem. That, that's where it first started, right there in Jerusalem. But a sinner can't do it. A, a sinner uh, always, without, without exception, he is selfish. I came across Russia and Siberia, and, and a, a few soldiers were up in the first class with us, where we were. The common Russians were back in boxcars that had no heat in them. Well, it was only 72 degrees below zero, and they had no heat. And when the train would stop to get rewatered and, and refuel and so forth, I'd walk back there, and, and they would take little coals and, and, and heat a brick or something on it and pass it around to let their fingers touch it uh, to keep from just almost freezing to death. There was certainly nothing common over there. Uh, we ate up there with white tablecloths and, and a lot of people waiting on us, and these military men ate up there with us. Uh, but there was no common Russians up there at all. Uh, there is no communism in Russia. There's nothing common over there. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a military uh, subjecting the rest of the nation and making slaves out of a whole nation. But there will come the time when we'll have all things in common. Amen. And that's when Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. We all will have a fair share, and you better believe it. Glory be to God. If you're glad for it, say amen. amen. I'll be glad when the deceiver is put down. He shall deceive the nations no more. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that that thing will all be finished. Uh, and your number 12, he is called the dragon. And, and we, we understand him as that. And number, number 13, he is called the wicked one. And uh, that is a good name for him. Matthew 13 and 9, the Lord Jesus gave that. When anyone heareth the word of God and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one. I'd underline that little writing there for, if I were you. The wicked one. He is the wicked one. Uh, he is the one that makes others wicked, but he is the number one, top, wicked one. And, and he, it, the Bible says he takes the word of God and steals it away uh, that they may not understand it, nor receive it, nor keep it. He is that wicked one. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, he is called the God of this world, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Isn't that an amazing scripture? The God of this world, and I would underline where it says God of this world. Uh, he is the God of this world. The world worships him. They don't worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, when people worship idols, they're not worshiping the idols. They're worshiping the God of this world. Uh, the idol is only a reflection uh, there that, they are, that they can see with their eye. But inside, it's the God of this world. And the Bible says the God of this world is the devil, is Satan. And, and he has deceived the people of this world. And number 15, uh, in Ephesians 2 and 2, wherein in the time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince. The Bible says he is a prince. He is a prince of the powers of the air. Uh, his throne is somewhere in, in the heavenlies. It's not upon the face of this earth at the moment. And that's the reason he hates television so much. <laughs> we invade his domain. With television, shooting the gospel right straight through the middle of it. And he can't do a thing about it but just get hurt. Glory be to God. But he is the prince of the air. He is a prince. Uh, in Matthew 12 and 24, he is called a king. Uh, he is a king. But by Beelzebub, the prince of, of devils. And number 17, a modern society is being bombarded by demonic and satanic uh, superstitions and aberrations. Uh, such as black cats, curses, broken mirrors, time of the moon coming up and the moon going down, astrology and tarot cards, and, and all of these things. Now, uh, from a child, we have sung the little chorus, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? Uh, that is the big bad wolf that we're talking about. And that's the way we are, are, are describing him. And uh, he, the bad wolf is a predator, you know. He is a killer. Uh, he is a destroyer. And we understand him for that. He destroys his enemies. He has no mercy. But we do know that in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no power he has to hold back the strength that we have to destroy him. So in this lesson, we're studying uh, Satan as a fallen angel, uh, as a head of the principalities and powers of the netherworld. And we must illustrate that the church 
of the Lord Jesus Christ will have to show this generation that we are not afraid of evil of any category. I, I would just love to stay uh, right with that for a long, 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 long time. That the Lord Jesus Christ's church is not afraid of any evil on the face of this earth. I'll predict to you the time will come when God's humble servants like us will go into the insane asylums and they'll come streaming out those doors with clear minds. That we'll go into the penitentiaries where they've got men locked in pits because they're like animals, living in there naked with slop thrown under the thing for them to eat like animals. That by the power of God, we'll set them free and they'll come marching out of there singing the hallelujah chorus. We're not living in the, in the, in the dim, uh, misty time when God can't do anything. The glorious church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this last few moments is going to be more glorious than it has ever been in the history of mankind. We are believing God for the greatest thrust of His Spirit and the greatest thrust of His power that we've ever known. And the reason we're here tonight is this. God cannot bless ignorance. You've got to know something. The big thing you've got to know is that you're a winner and that you can't be defeated and that you have nothing to be afraid of and that nothing can hurt you. You've got to know that.